Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to the workshop. So the motivation for this talk is uh, obviously learning graphical models, as the title indicates. Um, but the goal is to learn subject to a different criterion than is typical. Um, so we'll see specifically what that is. Uh, this is joint work with Mina Karzan, who's a student at MIT. Um, OK, so uh, to motivate the, the talk, uh, we're talking about learning graphical models. And although once you have a graphical model, you can do a lot of nice things, like uh, run MCMC and compute posteriors, which is of interest in machine learning, often you don't have the model. Okay, so what you have is something like this. You just have some giant matrix of data. What you would like is a model. Okay, so what you want is to go from there to here. And that's uh, what we'll be talking about. <laughs> okay. Um, so roughly, at kind of a high level, there are two goals when you would like to learn a graphical model. The first one is sort of the obvious one. Can we learn the actual structure, right? There are some actual connections between neurons. Can we figure what those are from the data? Um, people are actually friends on Facebook. Can we observe some, some data? Or they might actually be friends in real life, too. So uh, that's, that's also possible. But can we figure that out from some observational data? Right? So that's sort of the first goal. And there's been a tremendous amount of work on this. Um, but I won't really go into detail uh, at this point on. Second question, which is natural for machine learning people, is how do you learn a model to then make predictions? I want to predict whether you're going to like a YouTube video or something similar. Or I don't care what the actual model is necessarily. And that's more so the focus of this talk. Um, OK, so just to, to motivate this even a little more, uh, keep things light. So um, one application is medical diagnosis. And people actually use this sort of model for, for uh, medical diagnosis. The idea is someone comes to the ER, they're feeling unwell. And specifically, maybe their chest hurts. And you want to figure out, do they have a heart attack? So then, obviously, you'd want to take care of that. Or do they have heartburn? And maybe you should give them some antacids and send them home. Okay, so uh, you collect a bunch of uh, kind of information about them. Uh, they say they're tired, the heart rate, and so on. If you had a model, then you could, for example, run loop EBP and figure out what's the posterior probability of them having each of these uh, situations. Okay, so what we care about, in general, are these posteriors. Um, now, having the actual number for the posterior is useful. Um, because if uh, you get some really invasive, unpleasant procedure performed on you and you actually just have heartburn, you'd probably be unhappy. Um, and it turns out people are actually unhappy. The other direction happens as well when they actually have a heart attack and they're sent home. They don't like that. So, so, uh, um, so, so we want to figure out these posteriors accurately and actually help doctors uh, figure out what to do. Right? Um, probably less dramatic and less uh, kind of fundamentally important to your health, depending, of course, on, on how much you suffer from bad recommendations on Amazon and so on. Um, you might have a similar situation where you'd like to, uh, from a collection of ratings of people, predict the likelihood that you're going to buy or, uh, or like an item that you have not yet purchased or rated. Right? And so once again, if we had a model uh, specifying the joint distribution over all these items, that would be useful. OK, so uh, the mathematical problem is you have some model. In our case, I'm going to be interested in Ising models. I'm going to use p here to denote the number of variables. So it's a p-dimensional plus 1, minus 1 uh, vector. Um, people like p in statistics, so you'll have to forgive me if you're used to n. Uh, you observe a bunch of data, so n samples. Each sample is a full vector in p-dimensions. And the goal is to learn a model. Okay, now, I'm starting with the more traditional uh, learn the model uh, goal, and we'll switch that in a moment. Um, so specifically, the goal is, can we learn the graph that underlies the model from the data? And then we want this probability going to 1. Okay. All right, so I'll just quickly review a few kind of results in that direction. And then uh, do, that'll give context for the other question. Uh, yes, just if I said, so you'd learn, that means learning all the theta ij, essentially, when you say learn the graph. Good. So learning the graph would just be the support of the theta ij's. So which edges are there and which are not there. It turns out, actually, that once you know the graph, learning the actual theta ij is very easy if the graph is sparse. So if the degree is bounded by d, then it's you can just do logistic regression of each node on its neighborhood and figure out the theta ij's. Um, yeah, so for this problem, the combinatorial problem is learning the graph. OK, so uh, the first sort of basic result in terms of uh, kind of framing ourselves is uh, what's the sample complexity of this problem? How many samples do you need? Right? So uh, in that context, uh, Prasad Santhanam and Martin Wainwright uh, gave a, a result and that, that has the right dependence on the parameter strength. So I'm going to assume that the parameters, maybe I even wrote something here. <coughs> didn't, I didn't write it here. So, so if the parameters are bounded between alpha and beta, the difficulty of this task depends on those. 
Okay, now their basic construction uh, was to start with a clique on d plus one vertices, if I have degree d. And the idea is, as, as you all kind of know, for a ferromagnetic model, it's the typical situation is that most of them are plus or most of them are minus in the situation uh, if beta is big, if the edge strength is big. Right? In this case, it's, you can convince yourself it's kind of difficult to tell if I remove an edge. Okay? And in particular, uh, the KL divergence between the models is going to be small. And that gives you a lower bound right away on the number of samples that you need in order to learn the graph. Okay, now, if I have many copies of these cliques, then you get an extra log p factor in the sample complexity. It turns out that this lower bound is actually basically tight if I'm willing to uh, do the maximum likelihood search over all possible graphs. Okay? Okay, so um, you might ask, is this good or bad? Well, it is what it is, but obviously you don't want to spend this much computational expense to search over all graphs. Okay, so we want to do something better. Um, one thing that you can do, and this is uh, from a joint paper with El Khanan and Allen, is you can use the fact that your data is coming from a Markov random field and uh, a sparse one. So if the degree is bounded by D, it shouldn't be that expensive to search over neighborhoods and somehow detect that from the conditional independence in the model. And so you can do that. There are P choose D neighborhoods of size D that give you an algorithm. The sample complexity is roughly the same, except for I'm kind of off by constants here in terms of the dependence and the, and the power. Um, so it's polynomial and the correct dependence in alpha and beta. Okay, and the complexity is now polynomial for a fixed D. Um, so this is good. Uh, it's much less expensive computationally. Um, the sample complexity didn't get much worse. You can still ask, can we do even better than P to the D? If D is 20, then this is still expensive. Um, so just briefly, it uh, turns out that you can. Uh, and this is from a paper of mine from last year. Uh, it turns out you can learn the graph uh, in quadratic time. Okay, so time p squared. There's a log p there as well, the O tilde. And the number of samples is some constant times log p, which I'll get to in a second what that constant is. Um, so in a nutshell, what's the algorithm? Well, it depends on this, on this fact that uh, uh, Sort of an information theoretic fact that's true for rising models, which is that for any node in the model, there's always some node that has a mutual information that's pretty high with that node. And that continues to hold even if you condition on sort of arbitrary other subset of nodes. Um, which node it is that has a high mutual information might be different in that, in that case, depending on what you condition on. So um, from this, it follows that a greedy algorithm, which just greedily adds nodes one by one, will find the correct graph. Uh, sorry, find the correct neighborhood. Um, for each node, and, and that's doable in quadratic time. Um, okay, so I, I sort of put the constant under the rug. Uh, it turns out that this lower bound on mutual information, so how much is this non-trivial mutual information, is very small, very small when I measure it in terms of alpha and beta. And so then the resulting sample complexity here is uh, e to the e to the beta times d times a constant, uh, and that's double exponential, which is... Uh, in case it's not obvious, that's really big. Uh, so, so it's exponentially worse than, than the lower bound in terms of the parameters alpha and beta. Okay, so all this, all this discussion sort of motivates the question, why are we trying to learn the correct graph? Right? Maybe in some of these applications, like predicting whether you have a heart attack, it doesn't matter whether uh, which variables, for example, causally influence one another. The only thing that matters is I want to make predictions accurately. And maybe we can get by with far fewer samples than is required uh, to guarantee these, these results. Can you explain this inequality for a second? This one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. So this is the mutual information between xi, which is this green node, and it's saying some neighbor here in purple is going to be lower bounded by this constant. And the point is that the constant doesn't depend on p, the number of variables in the model. So for all i, there exists? For all i, there exists some neighbor, u, uh, with a conditional mutual information. So, so the more precise statement is condition on some arbitrary subset of nodes. For a variable that you have not conditioned on its entire neighborhood, there must exist uh, some neighbor with a non-trivial mutual information. Where non-trivial means? Non-trivial means satisfies this inequality, yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay, good. So, so this is really big. Uh, we want to have a lower sample complexity to uh, learn a model, okay? Um, so we're back to our uh, sort of setup. We have samples from a model. Yeah. Yeah. So you know that bound is, is, is the right dependence on, D, on the degree? Ah, good. Is, is the bound tight? 
this is in the worst case. Uh, I mean, this d squared, it's actually d squared here. It should be d. Um, and the 8 here shouldn't be there. But it is actually exponentially small if you think about, say, a clique and you condition on all the neighbors but one in a ferromagnetic model, it's going to be this small. Well, but d and d squared is very different. So is it d squared or is it d? I mean, you said it should be d, but you wrote d squared. Uh, I can prove d squared. I think the correct answer is d. But, but in, Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. One would like to believe that it's, that it's D. That's right. Absolutely. And, and regardless, though, you're going to get, so I should have even written D squared here. But doubly exponential in D and D squared are both tremendously big. Um, I mean, I agree that they're not, you know, D squared is significantly worse, but it, it's true. Yeah. I mean, the Eiffel Tower and Everest are both tall, but it's still. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's true. And, and here you have for all conditioning or the exist conditioning? This is for all conditioning. And if you replace it for all by the exist? This is a fantastic question. I suspect it's much better. Um, I, one conjecture that's uh, maybe uh, don't have that much evidence for, but I suspect if you condition on even just, say, one or two nodes, that there exists one or two nodes that you condition, and it's pretty big. Um, yeah. But that would need to be made more precise. Um, OK. Good, so, so let's change the question, right? Let's not learn the graph. Like, learning the graph is challenging. Um, it's, it's, it's too many samples. So instead, let's learn a model that has accurate posteriors, which will allow you to make predictions. Um, OK, so I'll just review a couple works that go in this direction. Uh, there's a paper by uh, Peter Abiel, Daphne Kohler, and Andrew Ng, um, where they guarantee that the model they learn is close in KL divergence to the true model. Um, where you look at the KL divergence over the whole joint distribution. So you could ask, well, what guarantees does that give you as far as computing accurate posteriors when you condition on a small subset? And the answer is not a very good guarantee. Um, so essentially restricting or, or sort of uh, the KL over the whole joint is a very stringent condition. And to get a small KL, if you want this to be smaller than epsilon, then the number of samples you need grows uh, polynomially in the number of variables instead of logarithmically. So it's, a, it's very expensive to uh, get a KL that's joint uh, that's jointly small over all the variables. Um, okay, so that's that's fine. And in some sense, the reason for this is that the whole analysis is based on learning the correct model. Sort of, they analyze what happens when you're slightly off from the correct model and bound the worst case error that that could cause in the KL. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's one result. There's actually another result that's much closer along the lines of. Uh, uh, we're going for, which is a result, a paper of Heinemann and Globerson from ICML a couple years ago. And they are motivated exactly by the same question. So they want to be able to compute posteriors accurately. They ask, well, what models can we compute posteriors accurately for? Well, we can run BP on large growth graphs with correlation decay. So let's try to learn those, because then we can at least are guaranteed that the uh, computations are going to give the right thing. Um, those models are easy to learn, more or less. and so they can guarantee essentially that you get the right graph, maybe with a few little weak edges that are additional. And again, this gives some bound on the KL, uh, which is translated into a bound for posteriors conditional on small subsets. Yes, uh, logarithmic growth, yeah. Uh, log n. Uh, log n, I think. Yeah. Um, good. Now, the. Uh, the, the guarantee that they actually get is pretty pessimistic because, again, they sort of go through this route of guaranteeing that the graph that they get is correct. Um, so kind of from a more technical point of view, the motivation for this is can we bypass this requirement in the analysis of getting the right graph in order to guarantee correct posteriors? Can we have wildly wrong graphs and still get accurate uh, posteriors? OK. Yes, yeah, so I won't go into the details on exactly what they get. Um, so to that end, let's look at a sort of natural notion of distance between distributions. It's not KL over the whole joint. It's not total variation over the whole joint. We care about posteriors condition on small subsets. So let's uh, have an appropriate notion of distance. Um, and the, the one for that is the supremum over all subsets of some size K, I think like three, of the total variation between the marginal on the set uh, between your predicted distribution P and, and the true distribution Q, or vice versa. And you can think about it for you know, five seconds and see that this will allow you to compute the posteriors accurately um, from Bayes' rule. Okay, and this is, so this is exactly the correct 
notion of distance in order to guarantee what we're interested in. Okay. Yeah. Why, are the, why are the sets small in your example? Uh, that's a good question. So maybe I should have pushed that under the rug. They, they aren't always small, but I think often they're small. I mean, you perform some 10 tests on someone. You aren't <coughs> test, testing every possible thing you could imagine testing. Yeah, so it's a good question. I mean, just how small it might depend on the situation. Um, yeah. OK, so in this talk, actually, we're going to think about really small sets. We're going to look at two, which means you observe nice. one thing, and you would like to uh, predict one other thing. Um, but in general, of course, you can look at bigger ones. And we're also going to restrict to trees, so not even locally tree-like, just outright trees, in order to try to probe this question a little further. Uh, it turns out, as far as I know, uh, these answers are not known, <laughs> even in this super simple situation. Um, OK, so just to recap a few things that probably all of you know, just to fix notation, if we have a tree, then, of course, the uh, correlation across that edge is uh, the tangent, hyperbolic tangent of the parameter. Um, we have no external field, uh, so this makes things a lot easier. If I want to compute the correlation between two far apart nodes, I just multiply the correlations across the path, uh, connecting them. Now the idea is that we have some other tree. The, we have some estimated parameters, theta tilde, and again, the correlation and predicted model is this uh, hyperbolic tangent of theta tilde. And again, the correlation is the, along the path if they're far apart nodes. Now, the, the point, and this is what makes it interesting, is that these paths could be very different, I keep saying. Right. So, um, so how do we produce a guarantee on how accurate is the marginal uh, when computed according to two different paths? Uh, that's really the question that we'll focus on for the rest of the talk. Okay, so um, concretely, I had this sort of more complicated Sort of distance between distributions, but for our purposes, the only thing that matters is that the marginals uh, or the correlations uh, between pairs of variables are accurate, and that's, uh, that's what we're looking at. So the supremum over all pairs or the max over all pairs of uh, the deviation and the correlations. Okay, okay so uh, we're going to embark on a little quest to try to find the right answer. Uh, we won't quite get there, but we're going to plot our, our progress along this axis, so uh, we're measuring here sample complexity normalized by log p. Everything is logarithmic in p, and we'll just start uh, like throwing darts at this board and see where we can get. Okay, so um, let's start with the question of why not just learn the tree exactly, and we'll see what that does. Okay, and we know, of course, that trees can be learned easily when you fully observe all the nodes, uh, and that's possible due to the Chao Lu algorithm. Um, okay, so let's see what Chao Lu does. Okay, so, um, so what is Chao Lu? For those who haven't seen it, it's a simple idea. You just compute the empirical mutual informations or empirical correlations between every pair. And of course, you don't know the tree, so what you do is you one by one add the edges according to the maximum weight. Um, unless, for some reason, you would like to close a cycle and you choose not to do that because you know you have a tree to begin with. Okay, so this is Kruskal's greedy algorithm. Uh, it gives you the max weight spanning tree. So you eventually end up with a tree. Now you can ask, well, when is it the right tree? So it's possible to analyze this pretty easily. Uh, and it turns out that the number of samples you need is e to the 2 beta over alpha squared times log p. Okay. Essentially, the analysis comes from thinking about when does uh, this greedy algorithm add an incorrect edge. And so there has to be some edge that's stronger than some other one, and you can sort of bound that deviation. Um, this is actually tight, so it's easy to prove also a lower bound that says this is the right answer. Fine, so we can learn the right tree. What does that tell us for predictions, right? Because predictions are what we care about. Okay, so in order to make predictions, I should tell you how to specify the parameters. Just learning the tree isn't enough. So the way to specify the parameters is just to match the moments across the edges. Right? This turns out to be the maximum likelihood uh, distribution fixed to that tree. And it's equivalent to thinking about an information projection, sort of minimizing KL divergence. OK, so this is a, a recipe for producing a model. How well does it do? Well, if the number of samples is at least this e to the 2 beta over alpha squared, the maximum of that and 1 over eta squared times log p, you can get a bound uh, of eta on, on this deviation of the correlations. Okay, so who knows if this is even good or bad or what this means? Um, well, we'll see in a moment that it's not very good. One kind of reason why it's not very good is that, first of all, it depends on alpha in a, in a pretty severe way. So alpha is a lower bound on the strength of the edges. If the edges are super weak, it's kind of dissatisfying that this causes the predictions to be far from the truth, right? If you think about just two variables and there's an edge, if the edge is really weak, then who cares if the edge is there or not? And so it's easy to make predictions, actually. They're almost independent. 
Okay, so I'll just quickly prove this um, because we'll use that in a moment. So assume that t is equal to t tilde, so that you are able to learn the correct tree using Chao Lu. And let's see how do we bound the uh, correlation between some arbitrary pair w and w tilde. All right, so just the, the quick sketch of the argument is that um, there's sort of a telescoping sum argument, and you can get a sum of martingale increments, and therefore get concentration uh, of the error along the path. The one thing that's kind of noteworthy is that it doesn't matter how many things you're multiplying, it doesn't, so the accuracy is just uh, sort of independent of the scale of, of the model. Um, good, and that gives, and that gives the correct uh, uh, answer in that case. So the first term in the max, uh, which I'll plot here, came from the requirement that you learn the correct tree. The second one uh, just came from, I know the tree, can I get the correct marginals, the pairwise marginals? Okay, so as I said, this is dissatisfying. Why should it depend on the, the weakness of the edges? Okay, so the next thing to ask is, well, why do I care about the weak edges? And this is an approach that many people have taken in various communities, including graphical model learning, uh, sort of fully observed, in, also in phylogenetic reconstruction. Um, and uh, various people in, in this audience have papers on that. And it's a very natural question. If the edge is so weak, let's forget about it. So, so let's look at an example. Um, and it's sort of the idea is, is simple. If you know, this edge is very weak and it's hard for me to guarantee that I'm correctly recovering it, let's just leave it out. Okay. And that instantly gives rise to a bound. Of course, the question is, at what threshold should I leave it out? And that strength is sort of the accuracy of the marginal that I'm shooting for. If I'm shooting for accuracy eta in the marginals, I shouldn't truncate edges that are stronger than eta because that'll introduce too big of an error. And I might as well truncate edges that are that weak below eta. Okay, so, um, so that's what you can do. You can just plug in here alpha is eta. And now effectively you have a model where the weakest edge is, is strength eta, right? Because you just forgot about all the weaker edges. And that gives exactly uh, the same guarantee with alpha replaced by eta. So we can go back here and we, we get something uh, it, it seems better. It doesn't depend on alpha. Okay. Now you can still ask, well, can we do something better? Because right? this fundamentally is depending on this, this idea of learning at least a correct forest. Every edge that I'm learning is a true edge. Right? And so can we uh, avoid that requirement? Okay. Um, so the sort of starting point is an observation about what Chao Lu does. And there's an example that contains much of the intuition. So we'll go through that example. Okay, so what's the example? We have this model. One edge is very strong, one edge is quite weak. You, have, you get samples from it and you compute uh, the empirical correlations. So here the empirical correlation is 0.02 and here it's 0.08, uh, sorry, 0.018. Oh, that's incorrect. Okay, so this is the, these are the true correlations. And the point is that you, you have an error in the true correlation. So what you get is 0.017 and 0.019. And so the, the incorrect edge has a stronger correlation than the true edge. Right? So if you were to just run Chao Lu, you would add an incorrect edge. Okay, now truncating the weak edges, as we saw, is, is a natural idea. The Chao Lu tree, on the other hand, as I said, adds the wrong edge. And finally, if I compute all the correlations using the Chao Lu tree, which is the wrong tree, we get this. Okay, so let's compare how well is this doing, which is the distribution using the wrong tree, to the one where I truncated the weak edges. Right? So obviously the weak edges that I truncated have correlation zero. And what we see, of course, is that the, even though we added a wrong edge, the correlation between one and two is actually not very far from the truth. Right? So something it seem, seemingly trivial but kind of interesting has happened, which is that adding some wrong edges has led to a huge improvement in the performance of, of the model. Okay, so we want to somehow leverage this intuition to, to get a result um, in a more general setting. Okay, so uh, good. So the, the result is this. It's that if the number of samples is at least the maximum of e to the 2 beta and 1 over eta squared times log p, then you can guarantee that the marginals are accurate to within eta. Okay. So, so this is better than... Uh, in the previous result, which was the product of the two, now we just have the maximum of the two. Okay. 
Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll give a proof of this uh, result, sort of a sketch of the proof, and we'll see some of the main ideas. Um, so the first step is to use triangle inequality. Uh, this thing turns out that it still satisfies triangle inequality, even though you're taking a soup. So we can more easily deal with two separate terms. One of them is sort of the incorrect tree. One of them is the Chaolu tree, and one of them is the correct tree. But the distribution is the same. Okay, and then the second term has the same incorrect tree, but two different distributions. One is the true distribution, and one is the distribution from samples. And we're going to separately bound each of these. It turns out it's easier. OK, so let's start with the second one. So we have uh, the same wrong distribution. One of them we're projecting onto the true tree. So there's, sorry. Uh, Right, OK, so the same incorrect tree in two different distributions. One is the truth, and one is uh, from samples. We want to understand, does projecting onto the wrong tree sort of ruin our distribution? Um, so, let's, so let's get an intuition for that. So uh, one basic observation about what Chao Lu is doing, you can ask is, when does it make a mistake? Okay, and it turns out that that will help us to quantify the strength of edges when we make a mistake. Um, so the situation is, again, this sort of uh, length three Markov chain. The correlation between 1 and 2 is mu. And let's make the correlation between 2 and 3 uh, tanch beta. So it's the strongest edge possible. I want to get a bound on mu. So Chao Lu makes a mistake if uh, the correlation between 1 and 3 is bigger than the correlation between 1 and 2. And so now if you get enough samples so that sort of the, the deviation of each correlation is this epsilon, this immediately gives you a bound. And so we can. Uh, write it down, and we can define an edge to be strong if the opposite is true. Okay? And so this gives us sort of a threshold for edges that we're sure are correctly reconstructed by Chao Lu. Right? And of course, this number is just some number. I mean, it could be 0.6. It's, it's not like super strong or anything like that. Right? So there's some number uh, where if the correlation in the true model is above that, then with high probability, we, we recover those edges. Okay, and, and it turns out that you can do something a little more delicate and get a square root there in the denominator, but it doesn't matter too much. Okay. Um, so we want to use this to uh, argue about what happens uh, to the correlation when we project onto the incorrect path. So let's think about some fixed W and W tilde. Right. Here in the solid line going sort of directly is the true tree. The dotted dashed line is the, the incorrect tree. But what we know is that there are these segments of strong edges where they're equal. Okay? That's sort of by the previous slide. They could differ, of course, on the somewhat weaker edges. They're not super weak edges. They're just a little bit weaker. Okay. So how do we use this to, to bound the deviation and correlation end to end? Well, if there was just one uh, strong segment and no weak edges, then the previous result that said that uh, when the true tree is equal to the Chao Lu tree, the, the error is small. That would suffice. That would apply here. Um, so here we can almost do the same thing. We can say that the error on each of these segments, regardless of the length, is at most eta. But of course, there are a bunch of them, so they're getting added up. Luckily, that cancels out uh, with the somewhat weak edges uh, that, are, that are going through these sort of deviations along, along the path. And the total end-to-end -end error is, again, just eta. So those effects more or less exactly cancel out. OK, so that, that gives us uh, the bound that we wanted on the correlation, um, sort of the second term. Um, I didn't emphasize this, but, but maybe, it's, maybe it's clear. We're just looking at the product of correlations uh, along the path um, in the same tree in this example. So in a moment, we need to look at what happens when you have a different tree. And this is the case that's somewhat more interesting and uh, more challenging as well. OK, so, uh, so let's see how the, the argument works. Th th there's sort of a, a basic lemma that makes things work. Um, and I won't talk about how to prove it. It was surprisingly challenging to prove. Uh, and uh, maybe someone here has an obvious way to prove it. So that would be interesting to if you can tell us. Um, but it's a purely combinatorial fact. It has nothing to do with uh, with, with any property uh, that these data are coming from samples. Um, all it says is if you look at two variables, w and w tilde, or two nodes, and you consider two spanning trees on the, on the, on the set of nodes, t and t tilde, or t and t, I guess t hat here, 
suppose that the path between W and W tilde are not the same. Okay, so there are two different paths. Then there exists a pair of edges that satisfy some nice properties. Okay, so what are these properties? Well, so here we've sort of drawn this path. We have the solid path and a dashed path. And what it says is that there exists a, an edge F in the solid path that's not in the dotted tree, in the dotted tree. So it's not in T hat. There's this G here that's in the dotted path, but it's not in the solid tree. But more, moreover, more important is that F lies on the path between the endpoints of G in one of the trees, and G lies in the path between the endpoints of F in the other tree. Okay, so this turns out to be true. These sort of special paired edges, and we use that to uh, to bound the error between W and W tilde. So um, essentially, this allows uh, to quantify the relationship between the correlation on G and the correlation on F, and then to do an induction that uh, bounds the error between W and W tilde in terms of the error on G, the error between W and W uh, and V, and the error between V tilde and W tilde. And so each of these paths is shorter in length, and so you can apply an induction. Um, what's important is that this is actually getting multiplied by mu F, so there's this sort of a lot of work that went into to getting this extra multiplicative factor, otherwise the recursion wouldn't work out. So um, that's true because of this paired edge lemma. Um, Good, so I won't go into more details right now about uh, the proof on this, but um, it turns out that it actually works out. Um, if you think about it for a little while, you'll, you'll see that 1 over eta squared is an obvious lower bound, because even if I just want to get the correlations accurate on each of the edges, I need, I need 1 over eta squared log p samples, right? So, uh, so there's a gap right now, okay, and that's, I guess, uh, sort of tantalizing question uh, to me is, which one's the right answer? Can you get something that's independent of the strength of the, the maximum strength of the edges or not? Um, so if people have ideas, we're happy to hear them. Um, this whole talk was about k equals 2. I don't know how to say very much for k is greater or equal to, to 3. You'd think that maybe you can use some tree recursions or something, but it seems to be more delicate than that to get the right answer. Um, so uh, that's still ongoing work. Um, and uh, I'll end there. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. Um, any questions? Okay, well, let's thank you very much again.